Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pleasant Valley Church. I want to invite you to come on in and find a seat. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, whether you're able to be here in person with us or whether you're able to join us online. It is great to be together today to be able to worship the Lord through song, to be able to hear from his word as we continue in our Jonah series, which has been great. Um, I'd like to invite you to stand with us, and we're going to begin by singing and praising the Lord together. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, and treasure the fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, for you've seen them all and still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. If there's not a place, your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. 
You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Amen. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. And you say the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good and you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when
when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid, because I know that you love me, your love never fails. Amen. You may be seated. My name is Amr. I'm from Jordan. I moved uh, with my family to the uh, U.S. We faced in Jordan a lot of persecution. Uh, it was so hard. But when we came here, too, it wasn't easy for us. Me and my wife, uh, Victoria, was praying for the, um, the state and the cities that don't have Arabic church. After a long time praying, God said Cincinnati. We have a significant group of Arab-speaking people, so we've been praying for quite some time. God, would you give us someone that we can just kind of turn loose in that people group, right? And uh, honor literally just called me out of the blue. There is not a lot of people know the culture, know their language, and can share the gospel with them. This is why we came here. Farmers of Family was part of the coronavirus relief. They just kind of called and said, hey, we got some free food. Would you guys be able to hand it out to your community? We opened the parking lot and the people coming with the cars. We talk with them, we pray with them, and also we take some boxes to deliver it to the families. They can't come here. It's an opportunity to share the gospel. We'll continue with games, we'll have egg hunting, and we'll have dinner, and we'll invite the people to go inside the church and join our service. It's wonderful what's going on. They feel in the church, they feel we are more family. It's an amazing opportunity. We came to reach our community, the whole Arab people, and now we have people from at least nine countries from the Arab world. When you give to Annie Armstrong, you don't give to an organization, you give to the missionaries, and that allowed them to share the gospel. God has brought honor here. And we're going to support him, we're going to encourage him, we're going to walk with him, and we're going to see God get glory among their people in Cincinnati. Well, good morning. As you saw in the video, um, we're using the um, time now through the month of April for the Annie Armstrong uh, offering. And it is an opportunity to reach out and be united, which is the theme. If we could go to that next slide, I think. I'm just going to use that and kind of jump ahead here. Um, the theme is united. And the 2022 national offering goal is $70 million. Sounds like a lot of money. Uh, much like eating an elephant, it's one bite at a time. And we get to give a little bit of that to uh, the Annie Armstrong offering and to allow us to reach out to North America. Uh, the next slide provides a little more information about what that uh, field looks like. 366 million people, 350 languages in North America. Would you believe that? 350 million languages. You heard a little bit about that in the video, reaching out to the Arab. 275 million people are estimated to be lost. In war, if you're a pilot, that's called a target rich environment because you don't have to walk very far to find someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this is our opportunity to share in that mission. Maybe you're capable of going out and doing those things and maybe you are in your local area, in your neighborhood. Maybe we are as a community in Northeast Ohio as we give through our local area and also through NAM and also internationally as well, obviously. Um, but even if you can't go, simply giving an offering to support the mission, all that money goes to those missionaries who are not going overseas, but literally within the boundaries of our own country and are reaching out to neighbors and friends and co-workers and others who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Whether it's delivering food, huh, we do that. Or whatever other means God uses to produce that harvest, uh, just go and give and be united. So we hope you take advantage of that. There are offering envelopes outside on the table, outside of the worship auditorium. If you would like, take one of those. They are specifically labeled for the Annie Armstrong offering. You can take that home. You can bring that back when you want to, when God has um, you know, told you what he'd like you to give. We will be collecting that offering throughout the month of April, but we hope you take advantage of that and uh, another opportunity for us to be on mission for God. 
I kind of jumped ahead there, so we're going to kind of jump back now. I'd just like to say welcome to everyone, whether you're here in person, whether you're online joining us once again. Um, we thank you. If you're a first-time visitor, we would love to have a record of your visit. You can take this contact card, which is in the pew back in front of you, fill that out and just drop it in the offering plate. We'd love to uh, contact you, give you a little more information about that. If you have a prayer request, you're welcome to do that. Last week we got one that said basically it was an unspoken prayer request. And I just want to let you know that whoever wrote that, that was prayed for. And so if you do have a prayer request, feel free to drop those in the offering plate as well uh, because that's something that we're on mission to do here within the church. Um, a couple other announcements that I'd like to go through as we're going through these things. Um, number one, Dwayne is back, and welcome back to Dina as well. Glad to have you both here with us. Thank you for braving the elements. I was looking out uh, last night outside, and I'm going, eh, dark and snowy. So I started reading Jonah 4 because I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to be on mission, even though you don't know it's exactly your job. But we're thankful for you both being here. We're thankful for your faithfulness, and uh, one, welcome once again. We look forward to hearing you from Jonah 4. Uh, some other announcements. Food distribution is coming up on Wednesday. Uh, it's early this year, or excuse me, this month, because uh, Wednesday started early in the month. And so if you're available to join us from 4 to 6 p.m., uh, if you want to, you actually can come a little earlier. The truck typically arrives earlier, but if you want to, come join us earlier. We're in the comfort of the gym, typically, uh, sorting that food, getting it ready to put out on the apron there, on that third lane that we use for exiting the church. Uh, we had a lot of people, about 111 families last time. We had about 18 workers. It was a good number, but we can always use help. Uh, again, we're getting nearer to the Easter season, so people may take advantage of that, especially with the f um, gas prices going up. There may be a greater need, so if you're available, please come early and join us for sorting and then stay as long as you can. Uh, and also that evening, we also have a time of prayer afterwards, like we normally do at 7 o'clock, so you're welcome to stay for that and join us for prayer as well. Uh, we're going to pray for our search team. We're going to pray for our new pastor, even though we don't know that man's name yet. We're going to pray for our pulpit supply, which uh, Duane has provided and others have provided as well. And we're going to pray for our church as well. And I'm kind of making the video guys jump back and forth. But next week, we get to hear from Abraham Diyali. He is an immigrant to the country, and he is planting a church in the West Park area because he feels led to reach out to the folks that are like him from his nation. You're going to hear more about him. He's going to tell a little bit about his story, and he's going to preach the word to us. And we're going to have a chance to see some of what your offerings go to in terms of supporting NAM, because he's supported my NAM. The money that you give is directly supporting him, allowing him to reach out to people who are unchurched or unreached, and so we thank you for that. A couple of more announcements for you. Um, one is that we have our uh, meal prep party, freezer meal prep party. That's Saturday, March 26th from 9 to 12 in the Fellowship Hall. Please sign up in the lobby. Kim and Mary are usually there most of the time, and you're welcome to sign up. This is an opportunity for you to prepare some meals for yourself. Just have a time of fellowship with the ladies. Uh, please sign up by next Sunday, March 20th. And uh, they would like to know that just so they know uh, how many to prepare for. Also, if you would like to give money or ingredients to make meals for folks who are kind of our shut-ins, folks that we normally see at church but aren't coming on a regular basis anymore and might need a meal, you're welcome to give that money or those ingredients to Kim or Mary. They will take that in information, that money, that food, and they will prepare meals for those people and distribute them to them. So another way we reach out to our church members and bless them with your blessings as well. Uh, finally, it's almost springtime. We turned the clocks ahead. I'm glad to see everybody made it this morning, but we want to give you a little announcement for something in the summertime, and that is Vacation Bible School 2022. Last year we had the opportunity for the first time to do it in person. Uh, we called out to you guys and you responded. We had between 60 and 70 volunteers for that. What a great response. We just want to let you know to put this down on your calendars. It's the week of July 11th, the second week in July. Uh, July 4th is the weekend before that, so plenty of time to enjoy your July 4th activities. But start thinking and praying about how God is going to use you for that VBS period. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, created, designed, and empowered. So we hope you take advantage of that. Uh, plan your vacations around that week. We would love to have you serve, whether it's one day or multiple days. Um, we'll talk more about that in the future. Let's stop now, kind of calm our hearts and turn our heads and our hearts to Jesus Christ. Will you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, it is good to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to know that uh, you are here with us, that we are um, the participants and you are the audience, and may we praise you, glorify you, and honor you with everything you do, everything we do. Through the words of our mouths, 
through the prayers of our hearts, through the songs that are sung, for the word that is preached. Thank you for the blessings that you give us on a daily basis. Those that we recognize, family, comfort, security, heat, water, electricity, some of the basic essentials that a lot of other people around the world struggle with. But thank you for the unexpected blessings that we never recognize, how you protect us and guard us from the things of the world that could overcome us. Lord, we pray for Duane that he's, he is prepared to deliver the word from Jonah chapter 4. We've had the opportunity to hear about Jonah's heart in chapter 1 and how he chose to disobey you. And now we're going to hear how Jonah has to struggle with his heart once again in chapter 4 as you lead him and guide him to what you called him to do. May you bless Duane with the words that he is to speak to us. May we hear with our ears and accept with our hearts your will for us. Allow us to be bold, to be faithful, to be obedient, to do your will. Allow us to bless you and praise you once again through song in this next song. May we give you glory at all times and in all places. In your name I pray, amen. The Lord is good and we want to continue to sing of that goodness. I'd like to invite you to stand with us. Let's sing together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing that again. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful 
And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's pray. Lord, we do sing of your goodness, and we are so thankful, Lord, for how good you are to us. Father, we thank you for how you've been working in our lives, Lord, and working in the life of this church. Father, we just give you all the praise and glory this morning. Lord, we pray now as we go into a time of hearing from your word, from Jonah. Father, we pray that you open up our hearts and our minds for everything you have for us this morning. We love you and pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Right out of the box, I'm going to date myself. There was a radio announcer I used to listen to, maybe some of you did as well, by the name Paul Harvey. Quite a uh, communicator. If you haven't heard of him, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and check him out, uh, just with his mannerisms, with his words, uh, with his heart. He was a believer, and that would come across in everything that he would talk about. And if you remember him, there was a statement he would always make. Now, for the rest of the story. Another phrase he liked to say was, page two. And uh, he would go on and elaborate on the rest of that story that he had so well set up. That's what we find in Jonah chapter four. Now, for the rest of the story. I want to ask you a question to ponder in your mind just for a moment. If you were Jonah and you had written the book of Jonah, how would you have wrapped that story up? How would you have brought to conclusion everything that had transpired? Uh, let me just suggest while you're thinking about that, I think if it were me, I'd have stopped at chapter 3. I could have got the opportunity to write a book about it. I could have made the speaking circuit about how God used me to bring revival, not to a few folks, to an entire city. Uh, best we understand, about 120,000 people. Uh, that will put you on the speaker's tour for years to come. I'd have stopped at chapter 3. I, I would have left it right there. But he didn't. And, and I've got some, these are my reasons why I think he didn't stop there. Because before it's over, Jonah got it. Jonah understood what he had been. Do you not find it interesting that he ends the book with a question? I almost titled this morning's sermon, The Unanswered Question. Uh, because if he'd have given an answer, I could have gone, Whew, Boy, that's good. On to the next book. But he leaves it open-ended, almost like he expects me to deal with that question as well. But, but I can tell you, standing before you, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm, I'm not like Jonah. I, I'm in no way, shape, or form Jonah. So to cause me to have to ask myself that question makes no sense at all. Or does it? You see, as... As Jonah unpacks his feelings in the fourth chapter, he tells us five times how angry he is. You're going to see it in a moment when we read it. And it's not just, man, I'm upset about that. It literally means the fierceness of his anger. Have you ever heard the term, I'm so mad I could spit nails? He was on the other side of that. He was, in one translation, says he was burning in his soul at what God had done. I'm not so sure he was mad at the Ninevites as much as he was mad at God. That God would have the audacity, the nerve, to save such a terrible people. See, and I'm not like that. Or am I? 
One of the things that I discovered this week as I went through the book of Jonah again. God puts each of us in the crucible to press us because he is most concerned to reveal the depths of our soul so that the life of Christ might even live there. Do you hear me? And had Jonah not had this type of a crucible experience, he could have walked away feeling pretty good about himself, like I just described me a few minutes ago. But God turned the heat on and brought Jonah to the depths of his soul. And so as I studied through this week, the Lord allowed me to go to the depths of my soul. Dean and I were talking about this just yesterday and again this morning on the way here about how indignant I can be. I can put on a facade. You see me for an hour on Sunday. I look pretty good, don't I? <laughs> but reality is, I'm just like Jonah. Because when God begins to put the pressure on, it reveals the ugliness of my heart. Do you understand that? As long as I can keep it superficial, I don't have to deal with that. But when I am face to face with my issues, when you're face to face with your issues, suddenly what is within begins to pour out. Have you ever heard the expression, when you're bumped, whatever is in your cup is what will spill out? Yeah. That's what happens. And so Jonah is pushed to the limit to show what's deep down in his heart. And he's been able to cover it with fluff. He can go around saying, God has called me to be a prophet. God has used me in Israel. Even in 2 Kings, it refers to Jonah, son of Amittai, that he was a real person. It's not a fictitious character. This is a real guy. But the book of Jonah reveals his heart. And that's why I believe the fourth chapter is so important. Because it shows that. Here's why I think it's so important in our day and time. Have you noticed how angry everybody seems to be? Have you even caught yourself feeling angry? I think, I'm, I may be wrong, but I think God has put us in a crucible to reveal our hearts that he might reveal himself. And until we deal with it, until I deal with my it, his glory is not revealed. And, and so when God's working through Jonah to reach Nineveh, God's working through Nineveh to reach Jonah. Bringing us to the place where I believe Jonah got it. And Jonah got it so well, he comes to the conclusion and says, I'm going to leave you with a question, because you need to ponder this as well. Think of it this way, what's your Nineveh? You say, I don't have any Ninevehs. I bet we all have a Nineveh, if we're pushed far enough. A prejudice, an attitude towards, maybe it was the person that cut you off at the traffic light this morning coming to church. Just gets under your skin. Now, I don't have that problem. I'm saying you have that problem. But. <laughs> but there are those things that the situation comes along that brings us to the breaking point. We live in the age of rage. And, and part of what circumstances do, we find it politically, economically, globally, is it reveals more about me than it does the situation. I've looked at history. Dina and I were talking about this too, about going through history. She's reading some books now, going back to the story of Hezekiah in the Old Testament. And we're really no different by nature. There is an, something that burns within us that brings us to the breaking point where all of a sudden we say, I've had enough. So oftentimes what we want to do, we wouldn't necessarily want to admit it, is like Jonah, we want to run to the faraway place so we can avoid dealing with what is really hurting inside of us. What's really broken. But do you know what? God loves you. God loves you. 
God loves you and God loves you too much to leave us there. So he brings us face to face with the reality of what's going on so that we understand the rest of the story. When I read in Revelation chapter 7, it says, and before the throne, picture this, before the throne was every people, every tribe, every nation worshiping him. John, I don't know how we get a worship set that fits all of that. But it'll happen because it's all about him. And that's the ultimate goal. You know, one of the things that really helped me, can, can I just say something transparent here? I, I try to say everything transparent, but I really want you to hear my heart on this. What really was radically revolutionary for me is when I read that passage in Revelation chapter 7 and realized who was going to be before the throne. And then I went back and looked at Dwayne and saw the kind of heaven I was marching towards. And it wasn't that heaven. It was a different heaven. It was a me heaven. God took care of me. God loved me. God gave me a family. God gave me a job. God took care of my daily things. Uh, things didn't get too out of sorts for us at times it was tough but God got us through that and that was the heaven I was marching to and I was looking for people like that like me that fit into my heaven and then when I read Revelation chapter 7 and realized what heaven's actually going to be like it was like the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and said Dwayne I'd like for you to be in the heaven that's being prepared by the finished work of Jesus Christ and something changed from me working towards my heaven to living a life towards his place of eternity. And if that's where I'm going, whenever I die, I want my feet to be headed in that direction, okay? You should want your feet headed in that direction. And Jonah was kicking and screaming all the way. I am so angry, God! But the heaven that I'm wanting to go to is not the heaven as it's going to be. That needs requires a transformation of my heart, of our hearts, of Jonah's heart, to say, God, what is it you're up to? And how is it in a world that is so broken? Do I not become another statistic gobbled up in all of this stuff? I was looking at statistics this week, and I won't take time now to go through all of them, on drug abuse human trafficking, domestic abuse, racial prejudices. It's astronomical. But you see, in Dwayne's world, I could isolate myself from all of that and never have to deal with it. And Jesus said, that's not why I came. I came to die for you, but I came in order that you might have life and have it more abundantly to open my eyes and to see him. And that's exactly what he's doing in Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4, we see some interesting things taking place in this passage. Matter of fact, Jonah, by some, has been referred to as a great book of missions. Why it is, as you'll hear even next week, as you heard this morning on the video, missions is a call to the uncomfortable. Does that make sense? It's out of what's comfortable for me to consider the greater purposes of God. Listen to what it says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, reading from the English Standard Version. After all this has happened, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Don't miss that. My country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, that far away point. For I knew that you are a gracious God and you are a merciful God. You are slow to anger and you're abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Can I add there? God, that's what they deserve in Nineveh. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, 
For you see, it's better, if you're not going to kill them, it's better for me to die than to live any longer. And, and God comes back with a question. Do you do well to be angry? Does this help you? How's that working for you? Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city, and he sat down east of the city, meaning he had gone all the way from the west to the completely gone through the city. And he made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he, could, so, till he should see what would become of the city. They had 40 days. Verse 6, now the Lord God appointed a plant. Don't miss the word appointed in this section. God appointed a plant, and he made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad, change of emotions here, because of that plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed, appointed a worm that attacked that plant so that it withered. Verse 8. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked again that he might die and said, It's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant and you didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't labor for it, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in the night and perished in the night. Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, the great city? in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand, and also great herds of cattle. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Dear gracious God, hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Teach us what it means to hear you and to be transformed by you. You came to save us, thank you. But you came to transform us. May we not kick against that which conforms us more and more individually into your likeness, God. So as you speak to us, even in those days when we feel like, Lord, let me just go on to glory. Let me get out of this. You do not let us escape all that you desire to teach us. But you promise that in the midst of it, you'll be right there with us. Thank you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness. And it's renewed every single day. Don't give up on us. But give unto us a clean heart, O oh God. Search us and try us and remove any wicked way that is within us. And then lead us in the way everlasting, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I want you to see in this passage of Scripture uh, just a couple of things real quick and in two main points. I, I want you to think with me about the Ninevites. We spend a lot of time, whenever we talk about the book of Jonah, we spend a lot of time talking about what? The whale, right? And then when we talk about Jonah, we spend a lot of time talking about Jonah. Nineveh is almost an afterthought. And I want to just challenge you for a few minutes this morning to think about the Ninevites. Have you ever really stopped to think about the Ninevites? Oh, they were a wicked people. They were. They were wicked people. Uh, they still had families. They still had goals, dreams, aspirations. They were still striving to make some sense out of all the nonsense that was around them. But they lived and breathed like us. Uh, we might consider them a good neighbor. Oh, they were bad about some stuff, but I've got worse friends. Have you ever thought about the Ninevites? 
God did. How, how do you look at your worst enemy and not look at them through the eyes of God? How do I not do that? To the person that gets under my skin the most. Have I ever taken a step back and considered them from God's perspective? Too many times we, we have a, not a tendency, we have an intentionality to paint our enemies to be all bad. Have you noticed that? We see that in the news, we see that in reading, we see that in sports teams. I'm not going to say anything about the Pittsburgh Steelers this week, but, uh, but we see that we, we paint our enemy as terrible. Therefore, I feel justified in my indignation and self-righteousness towards them. But I, I challenge you to look at Nineveh a little different today. Not because they were good people, but because they were created by the living God. And God had a plan to redeem them to himself. And they were as rebellious as Jonah appears to be here in his heart towards taking the message to them. And that brings me to a real sense of conviction. So if, if they were that bad, how? It, help me, I gotta, we got to talk about this for a minute. How in the world do they ever get to the place that some guy with seaweed hanging on his head, bleached out from being in the belly of a whale, comes and says, repent, gives an eight-word sentence, and 120,000 people fall before God and worship Him and repent? It's the same way when I've had experiences in sharing the gospel with people. And, and they receive Christ. And I kind of shake my head and think, that was easy. How did that happen so quickly? Because I wasn't the first one on the scene. God's already doing a work in ways I never could have imagined. And sometimes my greatest fears of not sharing with them, it took God a whole lot longer to get me ready than it did to get them ready. They were already ready. It was me he had to work on. And so once he got me ready, and I said, you ought to trust in Jesus. And they go, okay. I'm like, say what? That was too easy. Let me go back and explain it to you again. Do you really understand what I said? I do. That was too easy. Because God is already at work. I want you to understand, God was already doing something in the Ninevites. I went to a conference here just the other uh, couple weeks ago in Columbus called Love Listens. It was multiple church ministries that gathered together talking about the ministry before us in our cities. Let, let me just read a couple paragraphs from the material to you. Because of the density of our cities, they are places of incredible creativity where ideas are shaped, where people try new things, where people live untethered from traditions, where there is a ready audience for just about anything. Culture is primarily created and shaped by ideas flowing from these high-density places. But cities, listen to this, cities are also locations of extreme loneliness, confusion, darkness, and cultural forces larger and stronger than any of us. People get lost, and people get broken in cities. Overwhelmed by rejection, opinions, or in the face of failure, or in the face even of success, cracks begin to open up for people to ask this question. There's got to be more to life than this, doesn't there? As history shows us, renewal often begins in cities. It is the human density that leads to spark of a culture and commerce also is the same force that can lead to sparks of renewal and revival. If our vision is for spiritual, social, and cultural renewal of our cities, then here it is. We have to take a missionary posture we must learn to listen, to hear, understand their language, get close, build relationships, and to listen and love well. 
God was already doing something in Nineveh. And once Jonah got to the place where he was willing to go, God had already turned the soil. The seed was already there. It sprung up quickly and life came. Listen, the preparation to the world that is around us is ripe. This is not a day for us to shrink back in fear. Amen? Let me try this again. Is this on? This is not a day for us to shrink back in fear. Amen? Amen. This is a time where the church shines at its best. Because the glory of God, the only hope that can answer the emptiness in the depth of the soul is found in the person of Jesus Christ. The only place. So there is the preparation. But I don't want to get too far away from the word appointed. I love that word. It jumped all over me this week. It jumped all over me again this morning. Three times, as God is preparing Jonah, God not only appointed the messenger, he appointed all the circumstances for the messenger to get the whole message. You know what, believers, what we should be looking for today is not World War III. We should be looking for Christ in me. Because the world's always been stressed. This isn't anything new. The depravity of man has always led us down a road of emptiness and hopelessness. It's always caused us to turn on ourselves. It's always led us to try to make us known, myself known. Christ said, I've got a better way. And so God appoints things in my life and in your life, circumstances, people, surroundings, to bring about his appointed times and messages. And for Jonah, it, you, I looked it up in the scripture, did some research, like over 27 times, it talks about individuals that are appointed for such a time as this. And throughout scripture, God appointed an ark. God appointed a burning bush. Paul, uh, God appointed for Paul the apostle on the road to Damascus. I don't feel I've, I've, I've tried this whole week to figure out how to say this next phrase. And it just doesn't seem to capture what I wanted to say. God loves you so much that he will take the smallest of things and appoint them to bring about his greatest purposes in you. I don't know any other way to say that. I, I've thought it over and over and over again. God takes even the smallest of things and puts them right in your path and in my path in order that the greater purposes of his heart, the demonstration of his love toward us in Christ Jesus, is demonstrated through that which he appoints and plants right in my path, in your path. See, the thing that may be frustrating you the most, and you keep asking God to remove it, may just be something God appointed to be there, to teach you something. And, and if you're like me anyway, I, I kick against that all day long. I say, God, get that out of the way. It's making my life miserable. Well, look at what God appoints in the life of Jonah. And, and why he has to do this, this story reveals the depth of Jonah's heart. That's the first thing I want you to see. This reveals the depth of Jonah's heart. And the only way Jonah can really understand what all has been going on in him, and I imagine if he were Baptist, he'd have spiritualized the terminology for this experience. Because that's what I do. I try to justify. But Jonah has three appointments. He goes outside of the city. And look what Jonah sets up. He sets up a chair. I almost brought a reclining lawn chair to sit up here and kick back in that today. Because I get the feeling, we don't know how long it was. He told him, if 40 days, if you don't repent, God's going to destroy the city. I can almost picture him laying the chair back putting his iced tea, y'all, he's got to have iced tea, and his little table beside him, and kicking back and watching and saying, God, 
They're not going to turn. I'm going to prove you wrong. These guys are going to fold like paper in a strong wind. And you're going to have to call down your judgment on them. And I'm going to delight in it. And he sits back and he's waiting. We know he's there for at least a day because it talks about the gourd. It grew up at night. It was killed the next night. But who's to say how long this period of time of him just sitting by waiting? And with every day, the anxiousness, God, do something. God, show up. God, show off. God, God, they're in there. They're just like I always said they were. And I'm waiting right here, and I'm going to get sweet revenge when it happens. I can't wait to see the fireworks display. You know why I think Jonah said that? Because as I pondered this week into the depths of my heart, the Lord helped me see that's my heart towards my enemy. That's my heart in some situations. I'm not any different than Jonah. I'm just like him. And I think if we're honest, we realize that we have prejudices. We have those that aren't like us. And, and so we shrink them down to build us up. And Jonah waited. And it still was quite warm. So God allowed this gourd to grow over top of him. And it's a very leafy plant that grows very rapidly, even in the desert. And so Jonah, the next day, he's got this plant over top of his booth that he had built. And it's truly shading him from the heat. Now, he goes from extreme anger and shows his heart. Man, I'm kind of comfortable now. God must approve of what I'm sitting here expecting to happen. He, he's trying to appease me. No, he's taking care of you, Jonah, but he's not trying to appease you. He's trying to teach you, if you listen. And so Jonah sits there, and on that day, that night, a worm shows up and begins nibbling at the root, at the plant, and it dries up and dies. Jonah's angry again because it's, uh, we, we sometimes say we want to be happy. We want our kids to be happy. You do realize the word happy comes from the word happenstance. It means if circumstances are all to my liking, I will be happy. The Bible never calls for us to be happy. It calls for us to be full of joy. There's a big difference. And the distinction is that in him, our joy might be full because circumstances may not always be easy for you. And if you're waiting for God to make your situations of happy, then you're going to miss the greater lesson for the gourd he grows over you. God comes back to Jonah. He said, Jonah, let me tell you something. You didn't have anything to do with that. That's, that came your way. Because I did it. And now you're happy because of it. You, <coughs> you know how we do this? Stay with me for just a second. We do this in our circumstance without even realizing it. Think with me. Nobody asks you who you wanted to be born to. Nobody asks you that. Uh, nobody asks you what abilities you would have. Uh, nobody asks you what you would look like. And nobody asks you where you would be born. And yet, all of those things seem to be the things that beat us up. Now, if you think of those four things like a picture frame, nowhere do you find someone hanging a picture in a frame so that everyone comes in and marvels at the frame. What they come in and look at is the picture inside of the frame. What develops in that surrounding. Boy, if I were just born in a different family, if I just could do this, if... If I just had these looks, if, if, if I just had been born in a city over the country or in the country over the city, if I'd have been born in that country or this country. And we think all of those things in the same way Jonah thought about the gourd. Where the picture that God wants to build in you and me is much deeper than that because that picture reveals character. It reveals his character, 
in the circumstance. So when someone comes to the art gallery and they look at the picture, they marvel at the picture. The frame only enhances it. Jonah looked at the gourd as entitlement, being deserved. God said no. Have you ever wondered why you were born in America and not in China, not in Russia, not in the Ukraine, not in Europe, not in Africa, not in South? Have you ever wondered? God's using where he's placed us not to elevate us, but to build his character likeness in us that the glory is his, not ours. It's not entitlement. That's the same way with the gourd. Does that make sense? And then he sends a worm that kills the plant. I think of that worm like inconvenience, irritating interruptions. Okay, God, we got this gourd. We're just going to kick back and watch this happen. And this gourd shows up, or this worm shows up and eats my gourd. You got anything to eat your gourd? You've got your whole day planned out. And you don't even get out to the car. And you look outside and you got a flat tire. You don't even get started with your day at business and you get that phone call. It's those little irritations that interrupt my comfortableness. And we all say pretty much the same thing. Ugh! The worm was an irritation to Jonah's comfort. But then there's the third thing. He sent this warm not warm he sent a hot wind we lived in arizona and one of the things that happened while we lived in arizona i understood that it's a dry heat in arizona it was a dry heat that dina used last year for our turkey and you know how that came out the dry heat we learned quickly if we could get in the shade it would be anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees cooler than it was in the sun this heat cooked Jonah. Jonah just wanted to escape it. Do you have things that make you just want to escape it? You see how God's teaching Jonah? There's things you have no control over. There's interruptions that come to your life. And there are those things that happen you just purely, simply want to escape from. Jonah, that's all about you. And to be honest, Jonah, that's everybody's story. If we each went row by row, person by person, you could tell me similar experiences you've had in your life with all three of those same things. And for me at times, I blame God for all of that. Because either God allowed it or God caused it, so ultimately, God, it's your fault. And God's bringing Jonah to the place where what is my purpose is, and on me, is to develop a godlike likeness, not only on the outside of you, but transformational on the inside of you. So he reveals the depth of the heart. But then secondly, and with this we close, he reveals the depth of God on display. Can you imagine the worst image there possibly could be? And God shows up and shows off. Can you imagine if God can do that, what he can do here? Do you understand that when God shows up, because he keeps asking Jonah, what, what is your right to be this angry? What drives you with this anger? Are you mad at me because I'm trying to do my work of eternal value, not temporal satisfaction? Boy, that's a hard question to answer. And so Jonah comes to the place where he simply says, God, I simply am having a hard time forgiving. I'm having a hard time within life. Dina reminded me this week, while I pastored in Oklahoma, uh, we became involved with missions in Ecuador, in Quito particularly. And... Um, came in contact with a young man named Steve Saint. If you ever heard of Ends of Spear or Through Gates of Splendor, 
There were five missionaries back in the mid-50s that went to Ecuador to take the gospel to the Wodani tribe. When these five um, made their way to the people, um, they were people of trickery and they didn't trust outsiders, so they separated the missionaries from each other and killed all five men. Uh, Jim Elliott's wife uh, went back and took the gospel again. The, the message my husband brought, I bring to you, God loves you. She demonstrated incredible forgiveness. That forgiveness is an easy thing to talk about when someone else is forgiven. We, we marvel. We say, that's great, you forgave. That's wonderful. But then forgiveness in my heart is really a tough thing. Steve Saint, the son of Nate, became a bush pilot and went down and ministered among the Wodanis. And you know what they did? They forgave the Wodanis. They forgave them. The life of their loved ones taken and they forgave them. That is mind-boggling. Oh, I can say it spiritually, but I just want you to know that's mind-boggling to forgive someone. But they did. And they brought them to Jesus. And Steve Saint's children, who no longer had their father, Papa, the chief, who had killed their grandfather, became such a friend with the family, the grandchildren called him Papa. I remember when we were doing our missions conference and they brought the Wodanis in, uh, three of those who had been involved in the murder, who had all come to Christ, to our church for a mission conference. I, I remember, uh, the, the thing I remember the most is one night, uh, Steve Saint said, that they're just going to be here at the front and if you would like for them to pray for you, they'll pray for you right now. And I made my way to Papa. I couldn't tell you a word he said. <laughs> but I felt the spirit of his prayer. And dealt with forgiveness. Because God's greater purpose is bigger than me. And my gourd and my worms and the heat that I find myself in day in and day out. God's doing a bigger thing. He's doing a work in me. He's doing a work in you. That's why when he comes to this question at the end of the fourth chapter, it's so provocative and, and so revealing and so hits to the core of me. And, and I pray to you that I have to come to terms with the ugliness and the depth of my own soul. And the world doesn't get any better as long as I hold on to that. The world is transformed when I let go of that and trust God. That God works all things together for good to those that love Him and are the called according to His purposes. For those He foreknew, He predestined with a plan of redemption to transform me, to transform you. And in all the busyness and all the people we can get angry at this week and all the I told you so kind of feelings we can have, I believe God's taken us through the book of Jonah for me. I pray he's taken you through this book for you. So that we're not the same. You say, well, that's Old Testament. I get that. Let me give you a real quick New Testament. Prodigal son. Prodigal son comes back and the brother is also just like me. I have slaved, work hard, and you let this guy come back after he spoiled everything and you bring him in and you throw a party for him. Look at my duty of faithfulness. God's not looking for your duty of faithfulness, my friends. He's not looking for our regiment. He's looking for our hearts. A heart that doesn't see the world as those people but we see them 
as people for whom Christ died. And until I can get beyond that, they're never going to come hear me. They're never going to come sit with you. Not because we're bad people, but because they don't see the message we talk about being demonstrated in the walk we live out. You say, man, that's kind of hard. I know it is. I didn't want to hear it either. But that doesn't change the relevancy of what God is doing today in our world. So I ask you the question God paraphrased, of course, but the question that God asked Jonah. I created these people. Why, why can't you see how much I love them? Why is there such anger in your heart to not be a difference maker rather than a turf taker? The world doesn't get better with me holding my ground. The world only gets better when I hold up the cross of Jesus Christ. I challenge you to hold up the cross. The Bible says, die to ourself daily. Let's pray. Dear gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness to your word. As you speak... May we just be obedient, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. We desperately, desperately need what only you can bring. I pray, Lord, that today, as you speak, the evidence we've heard you has changed lives. Thank you for these and for theirs and for the impact through our lives, even this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, I'd like to invite you to stand and we'll sing one more song together. I think this is a fitting song. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee filled with messages from thee take my silver and my gold not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne.
throne Take my love, my Lord, I pour At thy feet its treasure store Take myself and I will be Ever only all for thee Ever only all for thee Thank you, Duane, for bringing Jonah home. And um, that question was asked a thousand years ago, but it's still important to remember today. But rephrase it a little bit. Make it personal. Lord, should I not be concerned with Parma, Parma Heights, North Royalton, Strongsville, Cleveland? And then the other question that Jonah was struggling with, what am I doing to make sure that blessing is secured, not because that I'm providing the blessing, but rather that God wants to use me as the conduit to deliver that blessing? And then wouldn't it be great to come back and hear the rest of the story in the weeks and months and years to come about you guys telling us how God worked through you to bless other people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come into your house once again and to hear your word spoken to us. May we be affected by it because that question was left open-ended because it didn't end at the time of Jonah's life, but it continues throughout the generations that are now and to come. We all have been called to be a part of your story, to tell about your story, to tell about the love of Jesus Christ, to share with others so that they may come to know you as Lord and Savior. Take away the restraints. Take us out of our comfort zone. Make us bold. Make us strong. Don't allow us to be disobedient, but allow us to be obedient to do your will. And may we rejoice at the work of your hands through us. In your name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.